I grew up playing with the Transformers action figures and watching the animated series. And when the animated film came out in 86, I loved it. When Transformers hit, I was right in the middle of it. I vividly remember transforming Optimus Prime. He was the best toy I got. A lot of us were raised on the G1 Transformers, those toys, those uh, cartoons. So to have a movie that's set at that time, there's a nice nostalgia to it. There's something about iconic personalities of Generation 1 that really resonates in the Bumblebee film. I think it comes down to heart. I think the heart of Generation 1 is really about the plight of the Autobots against the Decepticons, the straightforward mission to protect Earth, and their ability to connect with humans. With the design on this film, we wanted to make sure that we did something that felt more evocative of the 80s Transformers designs. At the same time, these are robots that exist in the same universe as the other films, and so it couldn't be such a departure where it felt like it was a totally different movie. If you see anyone besides me, what do you do? Great. So Bumblebee has a look. We just brought that look into the 80s and did some reformulation. We were using the original cartoon and some of the original artwork as our inspiration. OK, here's our launching point for these characters. And everybody was super excited. The geeks came out. I could hear people in the halls go, this is what I've been waiting for. Jason came and showed me all those designs, and I was ecstatic. I was like, oh my god, we're doing that? I made that my sacred mission. Like From then on, I was like, I'm going to make those guys awesome. The movie opens with a battle on Cybertron between these two factions of these transforming robots. The opening Cybertron scene was completely CG. The frames were really dense. There was smoke, embers, sparks everywhere, lots of robots shooting at each other, so there's muzzle flashes. And it was really challenging on the compositing front. It was a sequence that we had to do in a very short period of time with lots of assets. And that includes a gigantic tower that comes crashing down, taking out other buildings and things like that. We had this opportunity to not only explore this G1 look to that whole planet, but also to bring all these different robots that we all know and love back to that G1 aesthetic. We spent a lot of time researching each robot and, and making sure they were true to their G1 color palettes. We did refer to some of the old school toys and the 80s cartoon. If you look at the cartoon G1s, they're actually really simple. They're boxes mainly, like box legs, box everything. And that would not translate well into the real world. So we had to take the basic silhouette of the originals and then put details onto them, like Shockwave. If you look at his head really closely, you'll see that right next to his eye, there's, there's cutouts, and then there's all these little details in there that you would never see in the, in the cartoon because, you know, it, it wouldn't be necessary. So we draw from the cartoons, but then we'd go one step above and make it so that it looks like it would exist in the real world. Destroy the launch pad. Let none escape. You know, all the Transformers films have jaw-dropping visual effects, but this film, this is character work. This is acting. Tell me where your friends are hiding. I'll never talk. Is that right? We needed to make sure that Bumblebee and all the Decepticons that he goes up against feel like real, living, breathing creatures. It's not just something that looks cool. It needs to have emotion behind it. And the way we do that is in storyboarding, where we try to figure out, you know, what this character is thinking, what it's feeling, and then very clearly lay it out in really strong and evocative boards. And those storyboards were used to shoot the scenes on set. And then those same storyboards that were used to shoot the scenes on set were then given to the animation team here to make sure that that original intent of the scene was conveyed through our CG robots as well. When I talked to some of the designers early on about the kind of emotional performance that I was hoping to get out of Bumblebee, I said, you need to simplify. As much as we can streamline what's happening in Bee's face, those things that then can move and be expressive are going to be that much more powerful. For example, Bumblebee's eyes in this film are much larger and more expressive than they have been in previous films. We had to come up with a look for the eyes that allowed the animators to still express through the pupils. Um, you know, the pupils change size when he's scared or angry. So we wanted to put something in there that was complex, but not so complex that you lose the emotion. Do you speak? <laughs> And I think kind of opening that window to Bumblebee allows us to really, really see what he's thinking at every moment. So basically, the previous Bumblebee 
was more alien looking like. So which, what we did with this one is like we brought more earth elements to it, something that you can relate on, so like lots of car parts, a lots of like beetle parts. Uh, making sure like the, we can see the transmission in, on his chest. The tires are the right tires of this time. When you see B, you see the beetle inside him basically. And there's like all the details that you need to make sure they look real on camera. The only person you can show yourself around is me, okay? The performance that the animators at ILM were able to get out of Bumblebee was extraordinary. He gives a beautiful emotional performance and that's a tribute to all the arts at ILM. The Optimus Prime redesign was a really fun opportunity. We were able to take the character that we've all gotten to know from the previous films and then really inject some of that G1 aesthetic into that character. The 80s, the Optimus Prime was my favorite. And when they gave it to me, I was the happiest guy on this planet because I was the only one working on it, so I had to do it from scratch, which was awesome. It's not that super detailed muscle action on his face. It's more of seeing his overall simplified mask and it move a little bit. And to me, that's a lot more reminiscent of the original cartoons. So like the Michael Bay Transformers and the Michael Bay movies, it was more like an American truck. It was a lot bigger, almost like a muscle truck. But the original truck is more like a European truck style with like the, the flat front. As we look on the 80s in a happy, nostalgic way, you get to look on the franchise in the same way and be like super excited. So the end of the film, it really was so great to see Optimus the way I remembered him back in the day. That was the whole fun task about it. Optimus completely changed in that movie. We're going back to the original design. Is the guy that you knew when you were a kid. When I thought about the Decepticons for this film, again, going back to my experience as a kid playing with these toys, Autobots were always cars, Decepticons were always aircraft. And so the first Decepticon we see is this incredible fighter jet. When I saw the art for Blitzwing, I almost lost my mind. It's just such a cool looking character. He's got this intimidating silhouette with all these spikes coming out in all different directions with these wings and missiles. And he's a lot larger than Bumblebee too. Don't you think you could hide? This Decepticon is grabbing onto our little robot and dragging him up the side of a cliff and really, really beating him up. When we were researching for the Decepticons, we realized that Shatter was a Harrier and Blitzwing is an F4. And then we scratched our heads to think, oh, how are we gonna get reference for this? And then we did some research online and we found out one hour up north, there's an air museum that had both of these planes there. So we drove up there and we photographed the heck out of them. And that's how we got reference for these two planes. So Shatter and Dropkick were the first two triple changers we've ever done in, in a live action film. It's just really exciting to take the robots to like just a different level and have that extra complexity and dynamic nature to them. If you remember the triple changers, they were like very complex toys and you had to like you had like a 20 pages uh, manual to transform them. <laughs> so basically that, that was the same idea. Travis wanted that to like happen where like Dropkicks and Shatter turns into muscle car first when they arrive on Earth. And then Dropkick turns into a Cobra helicopter and Shatter turns into a Harrier jet. So that was the, the, the challenge on those guys was that, to make sure that the balance is right between the jets elements and the vehicles elements and the alien robots elements. So they naturally they're gonna get more complex, having like a G1 feel to it. So the balance was like a hard thing to get. Uh, but I think we managed to do it anyway, so they look great and I'm really happy with the result. It's a tribute to the production team that they were able to assemble this extraordinary group of people. All of them embraced what this film was going to be. They had affection and love for the Transformers, but they knew that this was a different kind of a film. It was super exciting to be part of this. And if I could go back and speak to myself as a kid, I think she would have been very pleased to hear that I had a job painting Transformers robots, you know. I was just so happy about going back to G1 and having to build some Transformers which is one of the best tasks I ever did in my entire career, basically. It's like kind of a set you do once in a lifetime. Nobody has ever had more fun at their job than we on this crew had bringing these G1 characters into this film. The joy and the camaraderie in this crew, it really was extraordinary. People really did love this movie and they put their souls into it. And I think that comes across in the film. Mm -hmm.